Am I a natural collaborator? Well, I would say I was. I, um, I started a lot of my career uh, around things where I was planning teams. I didn't realise at the time quite how seminal they would be for me later on in life, but there's always a point where teams have got to decide the balance of the individual against the collective effort. The National Health Service, I think, is a really interesting organisation. Partly it's big enough as an organisation to live within its own walls, so we can have our own tribes and our own sort of differences within our own sort of organisational structure to, to, have, to give us the platform to avoid it towards anybody else outside the health service. The second thing is that the health service has always had a sort of like clear drive that it, it brought a degree of professional expertise. And so it's kind of at its heart was this notion that you'd come to the National Health Service and the Health Service could sort you out and that would sort out the problem. And as a consequence of that, some of our really deep set underlying values and sort of like, uh, f for all benevolent reasons, are about what the Health Service can do to you. So let me give you a very, very good example of the Health Service on its collaboration. We see the customers that we serve as units of need. So our public health departments will describe the number of diabetics in a particular population or the number of people with cardiovascular disease. We don't see the assets of that individual, in particular about looking after themselves and their own lifestyles. You know, we don't see any partners around that, we just see a diabetic, someone with diabetes. And so trying to help the health service understand that actually it doesn't exist in a vacuum, that even, even for people who've got very, very serious complex problems, there are other players who've got an opportunity to help that individual themselves, their carers, their, uh, um, their, the environment in which they live, their housing contribution, for example. All of that matters. Trying to get that into play in the health service is quite tough. I think that some leaders in the health service do get this, but it's quite a battle because sometimes it's countercultural. Well, one of the perceptions, of course, is that collaboration is all about sitting around committees talking to each other mm. and, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the problem of trying to uh, uh, design a way um, and create services when all you've really done is kind of scratch your own navel and think about, well, what, what, what would we think about things? So I'm absolutely convinced that a lot of the reason why people find collaboration difficult is in their heads they think collaboration is about... Uh, sitting, talking and doing nothing. Of course my point would be that unless you've actually got the right platform in place, simply acting rather than having some agreements about what you're trying to do is, is again counterproductive. And I've seen lots of examples of individuals who assumed that they knew what other partners would want and went off and did it. So there is inevitably an element of it, I'm sad to say for those people who don't like meetings, that does require you to communicate properly and share something with, with colleagues. But I think you can do that much sooner than we do and I, I would agree that there is a fair, fair amount of labouring of that stage. My sense is that if you can get through that stage with real purpose and you can be focused in those conversations, you can get on then to get real synergy and action reflecting personal uh, and professional roles without having to come back all constantly and check out are we doing the right thing. Most people will collaborate when they're absolutely convinced that there's no better way of doing it. And the point I would say is that those people who naturally collaborate intuitively believe that, that that moment when they choose to engage other people is actually the moment at which they are more likely to succeed in what they're trying to do than less likely to succeed. So if I'm failing as an organisation and all of all everything's falling down around my head, I need to fundamentally believe that picking up the phone and having a conversation with A and other or pulling together a meeting of people is going to help me get this, these bricks that are falling down around me off my, off my back better than if I spent the time just lifting individual bricks. And one of the things that I, I talk a lot about this notion of um, people who are in organisations who are trying to sort of like sort of do everything themselves and, and it's just completely and utterly counterproductive because the people who can help them most you know, they're actually sort of getting in the way of, they're, they are, they're trying to do it themselves, they're trying to operate as an island, and, and their, only, their only means of understanding how success could be delivered for them is to think, I just need to work harder. And the truth is that that very, very rarely ends up being the right answer. In experience, I've, I've found often that I was at my greatest as a leader when I was most vulnerable, and I asked, I asked other people to help. Because me thinking that I knew it all and I could do it all, We'll get a result, but it's not got as good a result as the times when I had to turn around and say, 
I really, I, I need the help. I need some help here. And then people are motivated, people are inspired to try and do something for you. And what you get then is better than it would have been had you worked it on, through on your own. If, if I reflected on the things that I think are important in this, in this kind of area, I would go for walking other people's shoes. If you can understand what it is that you're asking someone to do from their perspective, you've got a far, far better chance to get that to happen. Secondly is remember that there are lots of things that go to motivate people beyond just giving information. You know, a lot of the reasons why we do things is because of our emotions, not about our beliefs. Uh, because other people do them, so normative pressure is still critical. And the third thing is that I think you've got to be authentic. I think you need to be true to yourself. So as a leader, you need to reflect your own values, and people will find out very quickly if you're not being true to yourself in the way that you speak to them. So trying to collaborate as a leader, I've, I've got a quite an intimidating presence. So natural instinct, I used to play sport. I was a centre-half, I was a fast bowler. You know, all my kind of way of being can be quite intimidating and to collaborate properly people have to be able to feel that they can work with you and that you're not trying to take their space or impose your will upon people and so I think that constant assessment of what's my impact with the people I'm with